The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. Leon from Rensburg, RSSA CME Director. Welcome to all of you again to the eighth uh, webinar in our series of ten presented by the uh, gracious courtesy of Dr. Richard Wiggins III from the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Um, Dr. Wiggins is Professor of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at the University of Utah and an adjunct professor in the Department of Otolaryngology and an ex-surgery in biomedical informatics. He's currently the program chair of the Society of Informatics in Medicine. Dr. Wiggins is a CAQ certified in radiology by the American uh, Board in Radiology and also certified by the American Board of Imaging Informatics, and that is no main field. Um, Rick, thank you once again for your uh, uh, commitment to education in South Africa, and tonight your topic is the uh, trigeminal nerve. The lecture yep. will most probably be about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then the uh, participants can submit questions in the inbox, as you know, and you can answer them live. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, and thank you very much that we're allowed to record this lecture to put it on the Asuker website. Yes, thank you, Liam. Okay, guys, so we're going to continue our lecture series tonight. We're talking about the trigeminal nerve. So we have a couple of lectures where we specifically talk about certain anatomy, and today we'll talk just about the trigeminal nerve and its importance. Especially with perineal tumor spread, we talk a lot about cranial nerves five and seven. Uh, so those are the big ones that we're frequently talking about uh, with perineural tumor spread, and there's some of the more complicated nerves. So sometimes we have uh, dedicated lectures just for those nerves themselves. Uh, so I have nothing significant uh, to disclose. And we're going to look at the anatomy and then look at some of the common pathologies that happen to the trigeminal nerve today. So we're going to start off looking at the anatomy, just like all the other cranial nerves. We think about almost all of them having a central cranial nuclei, and we think about an intraaxial segment, a cisternal segment, and then they go through foramen of the skull base. Uh, so every time we think about an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we want to think about imaging from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. And it's the same with the fifth cranial nerve or the trigeminal nerve and how we want to think about that complicated anatomy that's around this area. So we're going to talk about the anatomy and we'll look at this complicated nerve and all the frame and it goes through. And then we'll look at what pathology can happen to that nerve and how it looks a little different compared to all this anatomy. So we have some uh, four central cranial nuclei that we think about as contributing to one fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. And a very complicated course is that these nerves uh, extend through the face. These are the largest cranial nerves, so we have these large fibers that come out of the pons on both sides. Uh, so just like all other cranial nerves, we think about an intraaxial segment, a cisternal. Frequently, there's an intradural and then an extracranial extension uh, that we think about with each cranial nerve. So we have four central cranial nuclei that are contributing to one trigeminal or fifth nerve. And we think about three sensory and one motor nucleus. Those motor fibers are all going to the muscles of mastication uh, that are intraaxial segments uh, where they originate. And again, just like all cranial nerves, every, anytime we have an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we want to think about imaging from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. So we can think about the central cranial nuclei, five through eight, having their nuclei kind of within the pons, one through four being above that in the midbrain or mesencephalon and 9 through 12 being below that in the medulla. So we see these four cranial nuclei that contribute to the trigeminal or the fifth nerve here in this graphic. So first we have the motor nucleus. So we see here the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, and all those fibers go through foramen ovale uh, with the V3 uh, division that goes down to the muscles of mastication. And then we have three sensory nuclei. So on top, there's a mesencephalic nucleus. There's a nucleus that goes up towards the mesencephalon or midbrain. So that's the mesencephalic nucleus. We have a main sensory nucleus in the pons, and then we have a spinal nucleus that goes down kind of into the spine. So those are the three sensory nuclei. And then we have that one motor nucleus 
that we think about is the muscles of mastication. So the main sensory nucleus we think about is heavily myelinated fast twitch fibers. We think about that as touch and pressure. We think about pain and temperature being mostly in the spinal nucleus and the mesencephalic nucleus we think about mostly is proprioception to the T and J and mechanoreception to the teeth. So we have three sensory and one motor nucleus. So there's four central cranial nuclei that contribute to one trigeminal nerve. So then we have a cisternal segment, and this is the largest nerve. So on both sides of the pons, the belly of the pons, we see these big fibers of five extending out through the cisternal segment under the tentorium. And they go through the opening of the trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave. So that's the porous trigeminus, the opening of the cave to get into the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave at that level. So we have an interdural segment where these fibers are going through. We think about the semilunar ganglion or semilunar shape that is within that trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave inferiorly, just above V3 in a valley where V3 is going down inferiorly. So that, that's the main uh, semilunar ganglion. So then we have these three post ganglier segments. So there's V1, V2, and V3. So V1, sometimes called the ophthalmic division or ophthalmic nerve, V2, the maxillary nerve or the maxillary division, and V3, the mandibular nerve or the mandibular division going down to the mandible. Those are our post-ganglionic segments after the semilunar ganglion within the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. So V1 is going up superiorly. So we're entering the cavernous sinus, these valveless venous sinusoids, and then it goes through this cleft between the greater and lesser ring of the sphenoid that's the superorbital fissure. And we think about those fibers going above the orbit and cutting out the superorbital foramen, giving sensory innervation to the scalp and forehead. Uh, then below that, we have the maxillary division. So after the cavernous sinus, V2 goes through rotundum right here, and it goes towards the top of the tergopalatine fossa. And we think about that nerve, it's often drawn parallel to the optic nerve, but it's really straight and the sagittal plane going under the orbit and coming out the infraorbital foramen. And that's sensory to the cheek and the upper teeth. So we have very redundant sensory going down to the teeth from above. Then we have the mandibular division or V3 that's going down through foramen ovale. And we have the infraalveolar and the lingual and the auriculotemporal nerve uh, that we think about as going down inferiorly. So V1 going up to the superorbital fissure, V2 going through rotundum and V3 going down through ovale those are our three divisions of the trigeminal nerve or the fifth cranial nerve. And we remember that V3 is going down through a valley, then splitting in an anterior to posterior division. So we have one division that gives off all those muscles of mastication. We have a little branch that's coming forward to become lingual. And we have a branch going into the mandible through the alveolar foramen uh, to come out the mental foramen anteriorly at the midline. So the trigeminal nerve, in the cavernous sinuses, we have these valveless venous sinusoids that are on both sides. So the most medial object we think about is being carotid. The most medial nerve is six. And then we have three, four, and V1 and V2 going down the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Some people argue that these nerves are not actually in the cavernous sinus. They're in the fascial slips of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinuses. So here's another graphic of those nerves. So cranial nerve five, largest nerve, we have the prepontine segment, then it goes through the opening of the trigeminal cistern or porous trigeminus. The semilunar ganglion is within Meckel's cave or the trigeminal cistern. V3 is going down through a valley, V2 going forward to the rotundum, and then V1 is going through that superorbital fissure that we talked about before with the central skull base. So three, four, V1 and six are all going through that superorbital fissure to go towards the orbit. So in the uh, cavernous sinuses, we have all these complicated cranial nerves that are going through this complicated area. So when we think about the level of the pituitary is out laterally, we have the cavernous sinuses. And posteriorly to that, we have the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave at that level. So superiorly and laterally, we have uh, cranial nerve three. So it has its own cistern, the oculomotor cistern. So we sometimes see CSF density or signal intensity around V3 superiorly and laterally and the cavernous sinus. Uh, so here on a coronal T2 thin section, we're at the level of the pituitary gland, so we should have the cavernous carotid immediately lateral to that. And we see here cranial nerve three nicely in its oculomotor cistern, 
So there's a little bit of CSF around cranial nerve three that's superiorly and laterally in the cavernous sinus. Uh, so when we give contrast, we should see that that nerve is not enhancing. So we get a lot of enhancement of the cavernous sinuses around the carotid, but we see those nerves laterally within the wall. So there's cranial nerve three, superiorly and laterally. So below three, we're gonna see four, much smaller nerve, but also within the dural slips laterally, immediately inferior to cranial nerve three. Uh, so sometimes we see a little dot just below three that's also not enhancing. That might be the fourth cranial nerve, cranial nerve four right there, immediately below three in the cavernous sinus. So more inferiorly, we're gonna have V1 and V2 going down the lateral wall. So this is V1 right here, the ophthalmic division. So that's inferiorly and laterally in that wall of the cavernous sinus. And when we give contrast, we see this non-enhancing area. So here's a, a thin coronal post-contrasted, and we see cranial nerve V1 here laterally in that fascial wall. And then V2 is gonna be inferior to V1 more inferiorly, that's the maxillary division. Uh, so here we see a non-enhancing area out laterally. So we can see all these nerves, that's three, there's a little dot next to it that's probably four. We think about V1 being lateral to that, and here's V2 inferior to that level. So if we look closely near the level of the pituitary gland in the optic chiasm, we can sometimes see these nerves if we look closely on thin section MRI in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Now, uh, V2, very importantly, is going through rotundum and is going to the pterygopalatine fossa, a very important way station in the deep space, especially for a perineal tumor spread. So posterior to the maxillary sinus and anterior to the pterygoid plates is that pterygopalatine fossa. It's a very important area for us to look for for perineal tumor spread. Uh, it's a direct communication between all these areas. So it connects to the middle cranial fossa. It goes into the nasal cavity through the sphenopalatine foramen. Down towards the palate, we have the greater and lesser palatine canals. And we think about the superior and inforbital fissure kind of connecting that area to the orbit. So here in the coronal plane, we see that pterygopalatine fossa. So we think about cranial nerve V2 and rotundum coming into this area. So we have the sphenopalatine framing connecting the pterygopalatine fossa to the nasal vault. You have the little palatine canals coming down towards the junction of the hard and soft palate. So they're on the most posterior aspect of the hard palate. Laterally, there's a fissure between the, uh, the skull base and the maxilla. So that's the pterygomaxillary fissure. It's a fissure between the pterygoid plates and the maxilla. So that's the targomaxillary fissure that connects the targopalatine fossa to the infratemporal fossa at that level. And as we come anteriorly, we have rotundum here where V2 is going and the pterygoid ovidian canal that we talk about with cranial nerve seven and fairly and medial to rotundum. So V2 is going through rotundum here. That's an important connection to the targopalatine fossa, especially when we talk about perineural tumor spread. Uh, this is the high-heeled footprint of the skull base that we talk about. So if I find my condylar head and find the medial portion and go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's the oval part of the high-heeled footprint of the skull base. So the oval part is ovale where V3 is going through, and the spine of the shoe is spinosum. That's where the middle meningeal artery is going through. So here to help you is the high-heeled footprint of the skull base. And this is the high-heeled footprint in, skull, in the snow. I didn't make this, somebody else did. But the oval part is ovale and the spine of the shoe is spinosum. So cranial nerve V3 is going through this location and it's very important with perineal tumor spread on these cases. So we think about that anatomy, find the condylar head, centimeter medial and centimeter anterior, that's how we find V3. And we can keep following V3 through ovale at that level. So on the coronal thin section, CSF bright sequences, whether it's a KISS, a SPACE, a T2 FSE, whatever sequence you're doing, we're gonna see those big fibers of five coming out both sides of the ponds very nicely. So we'd like to see a nice root entry zone or root exit zone of the cranial nerves, and they go forward, they uh, enter the porous trigeminus, the opening of the trigeminal cistern, and then they're within the trigeminal cistern or trigeminal or Meckel's cave, that's where the semilunar ganglion is. So we should see these big fibers on both sides of the belly of the ponds, that's cranial nerve five. When we give contrast, we should not see enhancement of those cisternal segments. Uh, right now in our current technology on imaging, we do not see enhancement on the cisternal segment of cranial nerves, but we know that there is a lot of enhancement in the cavernous sinus, so we expect to see that anteriorly. 
As we go down lower here, we see Meckel's cave for the trigeminal cistern. So we want to see CSF signal intensity or density on CT in that area. And that's where we think about the semilunar ganglion living of the trigeminal cistern. So same thing in the axial plane. This is an axial T1. For us in the extracranial head and neck, the axial T1 is very important, sometimes more important than the post-contrasted because where there is air and where there is fat is very important for a lot of the pathologies of the extracranial head and neck. We want to see nice bright fat all around those structures. So here we see that tergopalatine fossa with the tergopalatine ganglion. We want to see nice bright fat in there. We want to see nice bright fat in the pterygoid plates and in the skull base. And again, if I find my condylar head at the TMJ, I find its medial portion. I go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's going to be V3 below a valley. So this nerve should not be enhancing at a valley or below it, but it's normal to see enhancement around it because we have this pterygoid venous plexus, a common pseudomass. So there's all these venous plexus around the nerve at that level. So the nerve should not enhance, but it's normal to see enhancement around it. When we look at a pre-contrasted T1 like this, the nose is dark here, the nose nose, we should see bright fat around the nerve. As we go lower, we see where that lower division of V3 goes into the infraalveolar frame of the mandible. So here's a small tongue of bone or lingula where that nerve enters the mandible here. And we can follow that nerve actually through the mandible coming out at the mental frame and anteriorly. So here are those no nerve fibers going through the mandible itself to come out the mental foramen. When we do the same thing in the coronal view, here's the big belly of the pons. We're at the level of the internal auditory canals on both sides. And we see these large fibers of five on both sides of the pons at that level. So largest cranial nerve, we should see these big fibers of five on both sides of the pons. As we go forward here, we see that semilunar shape. So we're in the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. So we should see CSF like density or intensity on MR. And here's that semilunar ganglion of the trigeminal nerve inferiorly and laterally in Meckel's cave or the trigeminal cistern. When we give contrast, again, we shouldn't see enhancement of the nerve. The nerve itself should not enhance, but it's normal to see enhancement around the nerve. So if all of this enhancing, we may be suspicious of perineal tumor. Normally we see non-enhancing nerve at ovale. So this is ovale right here at the skull base. And this is cranial nerve V3 coming out of valley at that level. So that's the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve. Just like all cranial nerves, we think about an intraaxial segment where the central cranial nuclei are, and there's an intraaxial segment where the nerves are going. Then we have a cisternal segment. Often we have a dural segment. And then some of the cranial nerves that exit the skull base, we have an extracranial segment. And we think about all those foramen that they go through. So for V1, we think about the supraorbital fissure. For V2, we think about rotundum. And for V3, we think about ovale, and then more inferiorly, the inferior alveolar foramen and the mental foramen extending out into the mandible. So what pathology happens to these nerves? Again, just like any isolated cranial nerve, we want to image from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. So we look at pathology from centrally, where we think about those central cranial nuclei, all the way out through the face. And there's a big difference when we talk about the trigeminal nerve, we may be talking about trigeminal neuropathy, any kind of pathology of the nerve, or trigeminal neuralgia, specifically talking about uh, tic doloru or trigeminal neuralgia, that's facial pain. So for trigeminal neuropathy, any dysfunction of the fifth nerve, so that could be sensory or motor, because we remember we have those muscles of mastication, those big muscles of mastication on both sides of the mandible itself, or we could have facial pain or numbness or weakness of those muscles. So facial pain is trigeminal neuropathy, facial numbness is trigeminal neuropathy, or weakness of those muscles of mastication. So one of the first things we think about all the time is nerve denervation changes. So just like a nerve anywhere else, early with denervation changes, the muscles may be enlarged, they may be bright on a T2 or a stir, and they may have strange enhancement. And as that enhancement decreases, we see an increase in the fatty replacement of the nerves. So here we see a more normal looking lateral pterygoid and masseter out laterally in this case, but we have denervation changes on this side. So this is fatty replacement. So this is late or delayed denervation changes to the muscles of mastication.
Now, if we think a patient has a trigeminal neuropathy, any kind of pathology of the trigeminal nerve, we're usually thinking about doing an MR. So we'd like to have T2s to look at the brainstem in those sternal segments. So whatever T2 CSF bright sequence you're doing for the thin section, uh, whether it's KISS or SPACE or T2 FSE or Fiesta, uh, we sometimes call them T2 images. We remember that the, the KISS, C-I-S-S, constant imaging steady state, technically it's not a T2-weighted image, but we often call it a T2-weighted. We sometimes call them CSF bright sequences. Those are very important to look for a vascular loop that may be pushing on the root entry zone or root exit zone of the fifth nerve. The T1 pre-contrast, it is great for all that normal fat we should see in the skull base and around those foramen. And we like to give contrast, especially for perineal tumor spread. The post-contrasted MR is really the best sequence for perineal tumor spread. Uh, CT is very good if you pay a very close attention to these cranial nerves, but it's a lot easier to see on MR. So for trigeminal neuropathy, we're going to look for those denervation changes, and we're going to remember perineal tumor spread that may be focal or segmental enhance, enhancement and thickening of the cranial nerve uh, or a specific branch. Uh, so specifically, if we have any kind of neuropathy, our differential is going to include cranial nerve V2, perineal tumor spread, cranial nerve V3, perineal tumor spread, and then vascular loop syndrome. We have schwannoma. We can get nerve sheet tumors along this nerve, or we can get meningioma. So for cranial nerve 2, perineal tumor spread, we remember that maxillary division and that perineal tumor may involve any of that core. So from the inforbital nerve to the tergopalatine fossa, back to frame and rotundum, to the cavernous sinus, to the trigeminal cave, and then it may go in any direction. So it may go anteriorly along V1, or it may go inferiorly along V3, or back into the cisternal segment in the preganglionic cranial nerve 5 to go back and touch the pons. So here's an example of a case. If I have no clinical information, like rule out abnormality or rule out pathology, I may completely miss this. But if we look closely, this patient has lost some of the subcutaneous tissues here anteriorly at the maxillary sinus sub-Q cheek wall, where we sometimes talk about the SMAS, S-M-A-S, the superficial muscular aponeurosis space or superficial muscular aponeurosis system, often referred to as the voluntary and involuntary muscles of facial expression and the subcutaneous fat that is adjacent to them. So we've lost the fat right here, and we have a lot of soft tissue here along the inforbital nerve, and we have loss of the retromaxillary fat pad back here posteriorly. You can imagine how easily this could be missed if you didn't have the history. If I told you this patient had right cheek numbness, we would look very closely at this, especially if we said this patient had a small squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And we would remember that perineal tumor spread and look very closely at the tergopalatine fossa. It looks like we still have some fat there, but along V2, where it goes back straight in the sagittal plane, we've lost the retromaxillary fat pad back here. So that's a subtle appearance of perineal tumor spread along V2. Here's a more obvious case. Here's an axial post-contrasted CT and the correlating post-contrasted MR. We've got a large lesion involving the anterior maxilla, and we can see how the lesion extends right back along cranial nerve V2. It goes in that retromaxillary fat pad, it goes through the tergomaxillary fissure, and it is entering the tergopalatine fossa. It looks like we've lost some of the fat here at the tergopalatine fossa compared to our other side. And when we look at the correlating post-contrasted MR, we have a large enhancing lesion. We see the enhancement spreading back along cranial nerve V2. It's in the retromaxillary fat pad. It's through the tergomaxillary fissure. And we see enhancement in the tergopalatine fossa. So we're going to look very closely and try to figure out, is there enhancement going back along rotundum in V2 or along the pterygoid or vidian canal that goes back towards the horizontal segment of the carotid? This is probably a normal pterygoid or vidian canal on the other side. And here we might be near cranial nerve uh, V2 going through rotundum on this side. We'd want to compare the pre-contrasted uh, T1 imaging to try to see that anatomy better and see if we've lost the fat at that location. So next is cranial nerve V3. If we have perineal tumor spread on V3, that's the mandibular division. So it may go from the mandible at the infraalveolar nerve uh, up that masticator nerve to frame and ovale and get to the trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave at that level. And from there, it may go anteriorly along V1 or V2, or it may go back posteriorly 
along the cisternal segment of cranial nerve five to get to the palms. So here's a coronal post-contrasted MR. I'm at the level of the pituitary gland. I see the cavernous carotid at the cavernous sinus. Now on this side, we have way too much enhancement and widening of frame and ovale. And this patient had a tumor below V3 that was crawling up V3 and widening ovale. Here's a more normal looking cranial nerve V3 on the other side. The nerve should not enhance, but there is normally enhancement around the nerve. So that makes it very complicated to evaluate cranial nerve V3 at ovale. Now, vascular loop syndrome is something we often talk about with both trigeminal neuropathy and trigeminal neuralgia. Here we want to see an arterial loop that is pushing cranial nerve five at the root entry zone and causing displacement, not just next to the nerve. We want to see the nerve being displaced. Most commonly, this is the SCA, the superior cerebellar artery, more commonly than AICA, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and less commonly, we see vertebral basilar dolichoectasia, a big and curvy vertebral artery and basal artery that's pushing on the nerves. So this is an axial thin section CSF bright sequence. It might be a kiss or a space or fiesta or T2 FSE. We try to find the big belly of the pons. We see those big fibers of five. And here is a flow void. There is a arterial vessel that's pushing cranial nerve five. And we see how five is displaced laterally. If we have a vascular loop syndrome that's causing trigeminal symptom, we often see significant displacement of the nerve at the root entry zone, and the nerve may appear atrophied. It may look small on that side. Now, it's not enough just to have a vascular loop near the root entry zone. We want to see significant displacement. So the nerve, instead of going straight on this case, is displaced around this flow void. So next we have schwannoma. We can get nerve sheath tumors anywhere in the body, but we like to talk about them on larger named cranial nerves because they're easily identified. And we think about them having a vector of spread along the expected anatomy course of the nerve. So we might see a bilobe lesion that may go into the trigeminal cistern or trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave above the CP angle itself. Uh, so here's an axial MR. The nose is bright. So the nose knows. So this is post contrasted. And I see a big bilobed lesion here that's going through the porous trigeminus, the opening to the trigeminal cistern. I should have CSF like intensity in the trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave at that level. And I see where those big fibers of five should be going into that area. So here we have a mass in the prepontine cistern. We have a mass going through the porous trigeminus the opening to the trigeminal cave or Meckel's cave, and we have an enhancing mass in the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. So that's a good appearance for a cranial nerve 5 schwannoma. Here's a larger case. As you can imagine, if you had a large mass like this, it would be hard to differentiate exactly where this lesion is arising from. So I want to try to look very closely at the anatomy around here and try to figure out what normal anatomy have I lost? Is there any normal anatomy that is supposed to be here that I can't see? And if I cannot find a normal ovale and a normal V3 mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve in this case, I'm going to think that this tumor might be the third uh, division of the trigeminal nerve or V3. And in this case, the surrounding tissues do not look very angry. You would think if you had a very large aggressive mass of this size, the surrounding soft tissues uh, would show a lot of edematous changes and angry changes around it. And this turned out to be a schwannoma of the V3 division going through ovale. So next we have meningioma. We think about these as extraaxial dural based masses uh, that we often think about at this location uh, that can be showing up at different locations. But if that dural based mass goes over one of the foramen of the skull base, we know that it may escape through those foramen into the extracranial head and neck. So we may get a meningioma from the dura that goes over that porous trigeminus, the opening to the trigeminal cave, and it may look a lot like a trigeminal schwannoma. So here's an axial post-contrasted MR. I have a lot of enhancement in the cavernous sinuses and around the skull base. If I just look intracranially, I have a dural-based extraaxial mass. Maybe I have a good CSF vascular cleft. I see that the brain is accordioned and I see those gyri or accordion adjacent to the mass, and I have dural tails adjacent to it, and I see extension of that abnormal mass and enhancement into the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave at that level. 
So that's a good appearance for a meningioma that's extending into the trigeminal cistern. Now I can have uh, intracranial pathology that's within the pons itself. Again, anytime we have an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we wanna think about imaging from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. So if I have a central pathology within the pons, we remember that we have those four central cranial nuclei that contribute to one trigeminal nerve and pathology, those nerves may cause abnormalities clinically of the trigeminal nerve itself. So less common causes might include a lesion like this, a cavernous malformation. So multiseptated, we might see fluid fluid levels with straight lines. There's not a lot of straight lines in the human body. Nature abhors straight lines. So we see blood products of different ages. We have old blood pushed to the periphery on this gradient sequence. Uh, and we remember that the fifth cranial nerve center cranial nuclei are right here at this location. So that makes sense why this patient may be presenting with a fifth cranial nerve deficit at that level. Here's another case. Uh, we know that uh, MS patients, demyelinating lesions often happen around the cerebellar peduncle. And if this lesion is near any of those central cranial nuclei of the fifth nerve, that patient may also have trigeminal neuropathy, a pathology of the fifth nerve. Uh, so here's another case. We remember that there's a long spinal nucleus that goes down inferiorly below the pons from the pontomedullary junction down into the medulla. So if we have ischemia down low, as we see here in this case, we can imagine that affecting that spinal nucleus inferiorly down below the pons. You remember also sarcoidosis. Granulomatous processes like sarcoid and TB love the basal cisterns. So it sometimes looks like there's this nodular enhancement along the supracellular cistern or the prepontine cistern with nodules of enhancement at this area. So this is an example of a patient who uh, turned out to have sarcoidosis. And this is a granulomatous process that's going along the fifth nerve through the porous trigeminus into the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave on this post-contrasted axial T1 MR with fat saturation. And this patient on uh, evaluation of their CSF turned out to have sarcoid. So those are all potential causes of trigeminal neuropathy. We want to compare that all the time with trigeminal neuralgia. We think about any kind of uh, pathology of the trigeminal nerve, but if it's specifically a unilateral facial pain, we often call that trigeminal neuralgia at this level. So that's a unilateral stabbing facial pain. It's typically radiating in cranial nerve two or V3 distributions. So we think about cranial nerves V2 and V3 as potentially uh, being involved with trigeminal neuralgia or facial pain or uh, the more traditional Tecidola Rue name. So we think about trigeminal neuralgia as usually being irritation of the root entry zone or root exit zone of cranial nerve five. So the best imaging for trigeminal neuralgia cases is gonna be an MR with an MRA. And the single most important sequence here may be that thin CSF bright sequence. So whether you're doing a KISS or a SPACE or a T2 FSE, whatever sequence that is, that's what we're gonna to try to do to evaluate these patients at that level. So we want a focused MR that's looking at the pons at the mid belly so that we can see that root entry zone or root exit zone and to go out through the face. And we remember all those branches of the nerve. The most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia is gonna be a vascular loop syndrome. There are a couple of other pathologies that we think about, but the vascular loop syndrome is what we're most commonly thinking about. Over 90% of the time, that's thought to be the uh, abnormality, if there is an abnormality causing the trigeminal neuralgia in these cases. So we wanna see an arterial vascular loop that's right at the root entry zone or root exit zone of cranial nerve five that's causing that trigeminal neuralgia. So here's a case, here's an axial CSF bright sequence. So whether it's a, a KISS or a Fiesta or a T2 FSE or a SPACE, whatever type of sequence you're doing, we're gonna find those uh, cranial nerve five loops coming out. And we're gonna try to find out looking very closely, is there a vascular loop that is significantly displacing that fifth cranial nerve? So we're gonna look very closely and go up and down. And we know that the nerve may be atrophied if there is a, a vascular loop that's been pushing for a long time on that cranial nerve at that site. So here's a case. We have a thin CSF bright sequence. 
Here we see a vascular loop. It's going right up to the root entry zone or root exit zone of five. And we see the big normal fibers of five on this side going out the ponds towards the Meckles cave. But on this side, we see how those fibers are draped over that vascular loop. So we have significant displacement of the fifth nerve at its root entry zone or root exit zone. And the nerve appears smaller on this side than it does on the normal side. And we have an arterial vessel that's pushing right at that area. So that's a good appearance for a vascular loop syndrome of the fifth nerve. Now, there are some less common pathologies that we sometimes talk about that may present clinically as a trigeminal neuralgia. The next most common is thought to be an epidermoid cyst. Now, these are congenital uh, squamous rests. It's kind of just skin in the wrong place. It's going to follow CSF signal intensity in all sequences except incomplete attenuation on flare, and the diffusion or DTI is going to show restricted diffusion for us. So we want it to be bright on the DWI or DTI, and we want it to be dark on the ADC. So here's an axial T2 image. We're at the level of the pons. We see the normal fibers of five on this side. And on this side, we see those fibers of five going right through a mass. It looks like it's following CSF signal intensity on the sequence, but we see those big fibers of five going right through this mass that looks almost insinuating around vessels at that level. And this is a good appearance for a CP angle cistern of an epidermoid cyst with the cranial nerve five going right through the middle of the epidermoid cyst or epidermoid tumor. When we do a diffusion, it's very bright. We see how bright this is on the diffusion or DTI sequence. We want to confirm that it's also dark on the ADC, but that's a very good appearance for an epidermoid cyst or epidermoid tumor where we see those fibers of cranial nerve five going right through the lesion itself. Now, these lesions are uh, often found incidentally, so we want to be careful about sending our surgeons to potentially operate on these cases because these lesions are very insinuating. They wrap around nerves and blood vessels, and they can be very difficult to excise without having significant symptoms postoperatively. Here's another case. This was a lesion in the Petrus apex, similar to that last case. Here's an axial T2. This lesion is in the Petrus apex, and it's very bright on the T2. This lesion is not enhanced, not bright before contrast. We see the nose is dark here, so this is T1 before contrast. Here, the nose is bright, the nose knows, so this is after contrast, and this lesion is not enhancing, but there is some enhancement around the outside of the lesion. So we think about epidermoid cysts or epidermoid tumors as not enhancing centrally, being similar in signal intensity to muscle or brain, uh, but the clincher, when we make this diagnosis of an epidermoid cyst here, we want to do the diffusion in the ADC, and we do the diffusion, and we see this is very bright. So this is an area where we can make the diagnosis before even doing a biopsy or anything else. That's a great appearance for an epidermoid cyst or epidermoid tumor. It's bright on the diffusion and dark on the ADC. So next we have a meningioma that may present with trigeminal neuralgia. Again, we think about these as the most common extraaxial dural base masses in adults. We think about them arising from the arachnoid capsules. It's an enhancing extraaxial mass, often with dural tails. And we look for a hyperostotic reaction uh, or permeative sclerotic reaction to the underlying bone if we do a CT. So we can have intraosseous meningiomas uh, that cause a very hyperostotic reaction, uh, but we see increased density frequently in the adjacent bone with a meningioma. So here's an axial T1 post contrasted with fat saturation, and we see an enhancing dural base mass in the prepontine cistern. We see nice dural tails. And we see where we have CSF-like signal intensity on this side. Here we've lost that CSF signal intensity. We have enhancement within the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave from this lesion. So if we have a meningioma that goes over the porous acousticus, the opening of the trigeminal cistern, it may extend into the cistern itself. So that's a good appearance for a cranial nerve 5 meningioma. Next, we have multiple sclerosis. So if we have an MS plaque in the midbrain, we might see uh, a patient showing up with facial pain, trigeminal neuralgia. You often in a younger patient, uh, they may already know the diagnosis of MS, and we see supratentorial white matter plaques, and we think about uh, them when we see lesions near the root entry zone or where near those uh, central cranial nuclei of the fifth nerve are. 
So here's a case where near the uh, ponds, the big belly at this level, we see where cranial nerve five is coming out to try to get to the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. This looks like an axial flare image. And I see some very bright lesions within the pons and the peduncle. If this is a young patient, say 25 years old, who has a known history of multiple sclerosis, this is a good appearance for a pons or cerebellar peduncle demyelinating lesion, such as multiple sclerosis. Uh, aneurysms, we have all those blood vessels in front of the prepontine cistern. So if we have an aneurysm of one of those blood vessels, they may push on the fifth nerve and that patient may also present with trigeminal neuralgia. If it's pushing up near cranial nerve seven and eight, we may also have sensory or hearing loss in that patient, but we most commonly on MR see a complex fusiform shaped mass. It may have very strange signal. It might be bright on T1 before we get contrast. We have complex signal due to changes in the wall calcification and clot, as well as slow flow or luminal flow within the aneurysm itself. So here's a case. This is an axial T1 image. The nose is dark here, so this is before contrast. We see very bright normal fat in the retromaxillary fat fat in the pterygopaltine fossa, but we see there's a very large mass here in the prepontine cistern. It is pushing the pons back posteriorly. We see where cranial nerve five is deviated around this lesion itself, and we have bright T1 signal. Now, there's only about five or six things that are bright on T1, so we have to put in one of those categories. If I do a fat saturation sequence and this stays bright, then I know this is not fat. This is before contrast, so I know that it's not enhancing uh, right now. This is bright before we give contrast. So this could be blood, it could be proteinaceous effects. We sometimes talk about melanotic and amelanotic types of melanoma. So melanoma may be something that's bright on a T1 before contrast, but this is a good appearance for a large aneurysm that may be associated with the vertebral basilar system. And we see how it's significantly pushing the fifth nerve in this patient who showed up with trigeminal symptoms in this case. We can also have schwannoma. So they may present with trigeminal neuralgia as well as trigeminal neuropathy. Uh, we might see it in a patient with NF2. Again, patients with neurofibromatosis type 2, they don't get neurofibromas. It's better to call NF2 the MISMI syndrome, multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas, MISME, rather than neurofibromatosis type 2. Again, on MRI, we look for a dumbbell lesion that may be extending from the trigeminal cave along the fifth nerve. And when schwannomas get big enough, we think about them often having intertumoral cysts that we think about as cystic degeneration uh, along with avid enhancement. If you're in a center that does IMRT and you're irradiating a lot of schwannomas, you may see more of focal blooming within the schwannoma itself or intertumoral cysts. You may see more of those in patients who have been irradiated. So here's an example of a case. This is an axial T1 post-contrasted MR. Looks like it's fat saturated. And we see this large lesion kind of extending along where the fifth nerve should be from the pons. A lot of enfacement of the fifth nerve, but it is extending along that area. And we can imagine this narrowing being the porous trigeminus, the opening of the trigeminal cave with large cystic areas. So this is a large schwannoma, uh, schwannoma that got irradiated. We could imagine the irradiated portions or the large intertumoral cysts happening along a schwannoma at this level. And often schwannomas get very large before we see a lot of reactive changes around the surrounding structures. So in the head and neck world, we not only talk about the lesion, but we also talk about the normal anatomy around that lesion and how it's reacting to that lesion itself. So uh, we have less common causes that may present with a trigeminal neuralgia uh, in the clinically patients. Those do include some brainstem lesions. So again, if we have an arterial venous malformation or a vascular malformation like a cavernous malformation that may happen where we think about those central cranial nuclei, we can imagine that patient presenting with trigeminal nerve problems. If we have a cavernous malformation, here's another case. Cav mouths are often associated with a DVA, old blood pushed to the periphery. We might see weird enhancement like we see on this coronal post-contrasted T1 MRI. Uh, but again, if that lesion is centered where we think about those big fibers of five coming out those pons on both sides, you can imagine how this patient might present with a trigeminal neuropathy or trigeminal neuralgia. Again, another case of a multiple sclerosis, 
Uh, MS likes to have plaques around the cerebellar peduncle. And we remember that those central cranial nuclei are near that level. So you can imagine this patient presenting possibly with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and again, we remember perineal tumor spread. Uh, so here's a nice example of perineal tumor spread along cranial nerve uh, V2 through rotundum from that uh, pterygopalatine fossa anteriorly through rotundum to get back to the trigeminal cistern or trigeminal cave. So here we like to see normal CSF signal intensity within Meckel's cave for the trigeminal cistern. And on this case, we see enhancement, abnormal nodular enhancement going all the way back into the trigeminal cistern, consistent with perineal tumor spread along V2 through rotundum on this axial post-contrasted MR with fat saturation. Uh, here's another case. So uh, similarly, cranial nerve V2 extension back along five. It's in the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. And on this case, it's also in the prepontine cistern with abnormal enhancement of the pons. This is very important for us to evaluate and mention in our report. Obviously, it's hard for the referring docs, our surgeons, to palpate the pons. So it's our job to tell you if there's perineural tumor spread going all the way back and touching the pons. If there's perineural tumor spread all the way back at this level, this patient is probably no longer a very good surgical candidate. So it's our job to tell them about this tumor at this location. So for all of those pathologies along the nerve, again, anytime we have an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we wanna think about imaging from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. So if a patient presents with trigeminal neuralgia, we have several intraaxial pathologies. So we wanna evaluate the pons and the medulla and the, uh, the brain stem. And if somebody has a CP angle cistern mass, a vascular loop, an epidermoid cyst, meningioma, aneurysm, or schwannoma, those may all present with trigeminal neuropathies or trigeminal neuralgia. We remember perineural tumor spread, especially cranial nerve V1 and V2, with perineural tumor that may extend along those nerves. And we remember that after that perineural tumor spread gets to the trigeminal cistern, it may go down through V3, it may go along another cranial nerve, or it may go proximally. So that perineal tumor spread may go distal towards the face, or it may go proximally towards the pons with perineal tumor spread. So that is a review of the trigeminal nerve. Again, just like all these other cranial nerves, we think about the origin nuclei, we think about their intraaxial segment, their cisternal segment, their dural sleeve segment, and all those foramen that they escape through the skull base. Anytime we have an isolated cranial nerve deficit, we have to image from the origin nucleus all the way out through the end organ. So with the trigeminal nerve, we need to image the pons. We need to image the mesencephalon or midbrain. We need to image the medulla. We need to image the prepontine cister. We need to image the trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave in the central skull base. And we want to remember the V1, V2, and V3 distribution. So if the patient has numbness of their forehead or V1 is actually supplying down to the nose, down to the tip of the nose, we want to look carefully along the supraorbital fissure, look above the orbit and look at the forehead. If we lose sensation to the cheek, if we have numbness on the cheek, we think about V2. We want to image from the origin nucleus, so the pons, prepontine cistern, trigeminal cistern, a long rotundum, the tergopalatine fossa, the pterygomaxillary fissure, the retromaxillary fat pad, and a long V2 in the infraorbital nerve coming out below the orbit if we have numbness of the cheek. If we have numbness of the jaw overlying, or if we have problems with the teeth or trigeminal neuralgia pain over V3, we have to image from the origin nucleus, the prepontine, the trigeminal cistern. We have V3 that's going down in the masticator space. And then we image the mandible itself coming out the mental frame and anteriorly. So we wanna remember that anatomy, the complex anatomy of the trigeminal nerve. And anytime we have an isolated cranial deficit, think about imaging all the way along that course. So that's a review of the trigeminal nerve. We wanna remember that complex anatomy and the pathology that happens to that anatomy all the way along its course. And I thank you very much for your attention. So we could check and see if we have any questions uh, from the audience.
Hello, Luan. Yes. Okay, the uh, inbox facility is open. It's a very complicated nerve. So yes. tell us how hepatic basilar artery, uh, Kenneth writes, uh, deforming the medulla seems quite common. Yes, it is very common. This is very complicated for us, and we often see vascular loops near these cranial nerves in the cisternal segments. So we, we want to be careful that we only want to talk about it if it's significantly displacing the nerve at the root entry zone or the root exit zone of the cranial nerves, depending on how you think about it. Uh, we don't want to think about a vascular loop syndrome if we just see a flow void near the cranial nerve or if it's in the middle of the cisternal segment. Uh, we only want to talk about it as potentially involving the nerve. And my surgeons pretty much just talk about cranial nerves five and seven with vascular loop syndromes. But some people are more sensitive and believe that any cranial nerve may be involved with a vascular loop. So dolichoectasia of the uh, basilar artery and the vertebral arteries deforming the medulla, you're right, are relatively common. We only want to talk about it as a potential source of trigeminal neuralgia if it's significantly displacing the root entry zone or root exit zone of the cranial nerves. That's right, good question. Anything else in there? Uh, so there's a question here about uh, V1, V2, and V3 in the deep face. Uh, do you use a thin section uh, 3D T1 volume? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, some people like the uh, the the advanced imaging kind of MP rage or or, uh, or FSPGR T1 imaging. Like I have to say that I really don't like uh, those sequences. Uh, they're very good for looking at volume of brain parenchyma, but the MP rage and the FSPGR volumetric T1 acquisitions and the extracranial head and neck are bad because it often suppresses the normal fat and the extracranial head and neck and in the skull base. So uh, I really don't like the FSPGR and the MP rage, the 3D volumetric acquisitions uh, for T1. We have a lot of fancy sequences. We have these advanced imaging uh, that we talk about sometimes with uh, MR spectroscopy and DSC and DCE and MR perfusion, but the plain old basic T1 and T2 actually give us a lot of information if we just pay attention to it. So I would much rather have a basic plain old T1 because I know that's going to show me the fat much nicer in the skull base and in the extracranial head and neck. Let's see, there's a question about uh, suspected cranial nerve 5 neuralgia uh, flared in the kiss. Do we always add contrast? Uh, I try to give contrast, especially if anybody says tumor or infection, uh, when somebody has a cranial nerve 5, any cranial nerve problem. Uh, but if somebody just says trigeminal neuralgia, about 90% of the time, to patient, depending on your patient population, we're going to think about a vascular loop problem. So I think the single most important sequence is to get that case or spice, uh, space or kiss or fiesta, whatever CSF bright sequence you're doing, uh, those thin sections through the root entry zone. I, I want to try to do that sequence first uh, so that I'm evaluating that anatomy and the root entry zone and the root exit zone. Uh, so we try to give contrast, especially if somebody says tumor or infection, or if there are any other red flags uh, that may make us more suspicious of a tumor or infection like perineal tumor spread, because we definitely want to give contrast for perineal tumor spread. Uh, so that, that's a good question. Uh, is neuralgia necessarily a precursor to neuropathy? So we often think about trigeminal neuralgia as a type of trigeminal neuropathy. So a neuropathy is any kind of pathology of the nerve. So trigeminal neuropathy may be numbness, it may be pain, or it may be the muscles of mastication problem like trismus or denervation. So I would say that trigeminal neuralgia is a type of trigeminal neuropathy, not necessarily a precursor to it. I would say that neuralgia is a type of neuropathy. Uh, facial pain is a type of pathology of the facial nerve. Uh, how often is the MRI scan normal for trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, I would say that sometimes we have cranial nerve deficits, and especially if you're in a, a patient population where I have, where you have a lot of older patients who are on a lot of different meds and a lot of different drugs, we often don't actually know how all those drugs interact with each other. Uh, so I would say that, yes, sometimes uh, the MRI scan is normal for trigeminal neuralgia, uh, 
but if we look closely, we can frequently find an abnormality. I would guess, depending on your patient population, uh, maybe about half the patients who clinically really have trigeminal neuralgia, if they really have tic doloureux and that uh, paroxysmal facial pain, if they really have that, maybe half the time we may not find anything. But if we look closely, we often will find something. And if you do find something about 90% of the time, it's gonna be that vascular loop syndrome. So that's what we wanna look for. So the most important sequence to me, if somebody really has trigeminal neuralgia clinically, is to do that CSF bright sequence, a KISS, Fiesta, SPACE, T2FSE, whatever it is that you're doing at your shop, depending on your vendor. That's the most important sequence to me and the one I wanna do first. Thank you. Any any more questions there? No, no more no, questions. I think that's all we got. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, uh, it's an excellent lecture and uh, obviously a very enthusiastic response from the audience. And uh, you're now eight down, two to go. Uh, thank you very much for your time and that's your. It. <laughs> uh, We'll be in touch. Have a good night or a good day there. Great. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Yeah.